Biden Fox was reluctant to acknowledge the shell trumpets. He stared, deep in thought, for a long time. His eyes, yet to betray him, emoted nothing. He was unseeing, working through dense thought as it arose amidst billowing clouds. The bird to his left, perched and attentive, eager for his master's cue, remained fixed on the man's countenance, waiting for a call to action. I didn't entertain the idea of negligence for a long time. This sort of stoic rebellion was not uncommon for the woodsman. Non-action, if not tardiness at least, he felt was an acceptable form of rebellion. He would take his time in considering what he was to do next. Shell trumpets were a very serious matter indeed. The elven court was summoning the entire kingdom, from ogres to sprites, all were to report to the citadel behind the alabaster waterfalls. Serving the elven court was something that I didn't avoid it, if it could be helped. It was only recently that the palace had gone quiet. The usual correspondence, delivered by carrier pigeon, had mysteriously ended. His last response to the king hung in the air for the last fortnight. They were negotiating his contract for another century, but Aiden had no inclination to worry, not about slow employment. He was beginning to relax and enjoy his newfound peace before this new development arose. His yearning for freedom swiftly inverted into resistance. If he wasn't hounded by the royal retinue so persistently, he would have the time to find more suitable employment very easily elsewhere. He'd much rather offer his keen skills to the wild folk. Their deluded and absurd fancies were at least heartfelt and sincere, often vulnerable to hope they could easily convince themselves that their missing children were merely suspended in the unknown. In reality, they were far more likely to be burnt on a tall stack of wood pallets in the human realm or surrendered to the belly of some demonic beast. The likelihood of Aiden recovering such missing persons was negligible, but their requests, as unrealistic as they often were, always revealed a warm sentiment. They were good people, and he appreciated that. He believed in it. He thought about what he might barter the High Davis to grant him such employment. Davis seemed so skilled in turning a man's luck, but to catch one's ear was as unlikely as being born as one. He had an intrusive vision of squabbling politicians and whispering courtiers, eliciting petty affairs. He let a rush of hot air expel from his mouth. He had been holding his breath. Gold coins hardly seem enough to entice me into such debauchery, he thought. But I likely won't be encountering that kind of work if I'm being summoned by trumpets. The sound of brass and percussion continued to resonate through the realm, he thought again. On the other hand, trumpets and drums indicate war. I really hate war. Another long swooping note rang through the trees. He knew this forest well, engaged in his profession for the better half of 400 years. But when he heard the shell trumpet ricocheting off the granite cliff face at a 50 degree angle rather than a 45 degree angle, he knew that the call was coming from the ceremonial drop-off rather than the war room. Peculiar. He could only conclude that it was not, in fact, a notation of war. He assumed the sound was merely a call to action. But Aiden has never willingly been known to entertain blind surprise. He had no interest in walking into an overpopulated palace, only to then learn why he was there. He knew how easily he could be employed toward nonsense if cornered by four stone walls. He nodded at the raptor perched nearby. He gesticulated an invitation. The bird flowed up to his arm and waited for his instructions. Aiden nodded while looking directly into the bird's right eye. The condor already knew what he was being asked to do. Aiden launched him into the air and the bird was soon out of sight. His loyal condor crew, a motley bunch of half-molted, hyper-intelligent hawk variants, are uncanny in their ability to pierce into secret vaults by means of aerial observation alone. Aiden hoards these secrets, managing their dissemination behind a conveniently priced wall of lip and tongue. A half bag of acorn flour will do in most cases. A woven garment, medicine, tonics, and cutlery can be bartered too, if he needs such amenities. 
His simple way of living and seasonal nomadicism reflect in his prices, the immediacy by which he lives his life. Iden identifies with the wild folk, a preference for solitude and woodland depths. To look at him would be to see both functional elements, clips and pockets, shellac boots, rain flick fringe, but also a reverence for wild folk tradition, embroidered handkerchief and bluebell adornments, head wrap and false antennae, but his most prominent statement being that of the padded leather sleeves for which his bird employment posture. Few lived by the condor so religiously and inclined towards them so closely. There, on the leather padded sleeve, they perched and whispered their secrets. Aiden turned to make his way back up the hill. If focused on tracking down an animal, he could be silent as an owl in the night. But when at his leisure, the shifting of his garments revealed the subtle sounds of scraping rust and hollow ceramic cookware. He always had an assortment of tools in his leafy jacket. Aiden's appearance is that of a rough old man, and to a degree, he could be considered unkept. There is also something extraordinary about him. Not so much in his complexion, his chalky skin offers a dull overcast, subduing his features into something grim. But he is, somehow, stately. There are those who speculate him to be a renounced prince. A rounded, bilaterally bulging forehead, wide set eyes, and jutting jaw all suggest a likeness to the royal goblin family, a lineage lost to time some half millennia ago. All fae have a certain talent for that special knowing, and even quiet strangers can't help but emanate their truth. Wild fae and village fae see quite plainly that he carries himself differently. His nature is that of a kind gentleman, he is noble slow, polite, patient to make conclusions, he reflects deeply before speaking, and, oddly enough, very rarely blinks. But if you wait for a long moment, you'll notice he closes each eye independently, one at a time, as if every aspect of his functioning is deliberate and manually applied. 2300 years ago, 200 years after the time of the Buddha, was a fascinating span in human history. King Ashoka, once a warrior king, underwent a profound transformation upon witnessing the harrowing toll of civilian casualties. He saw the widowed wives, slaughtered children, defigured men, and displaced families left in the wake of the Kalings War. Moved by the tragic consequences of his own bloodthirsty ambition, Ashoka was prompted to reassess his role as a leader. Committing himself to the welfare of his people and those beyond his kingdom's borders, Ashoka embarked on a path of service. Notably, he became an early advocate for animal rights and extended foreign aid, a departure from the militaristic pursuits of his past. Ashoka was born to a Buddhist family, but did not observe such spiritual leanings in any meaningful way. He disregarded all prescriptions of moral conduct, reportedly killing many of his brothers. There was also the additional death toll in conquering the bordering towns by the fire of his insatiable greed. But, his realization led him to champion the ideals of selfless service, observance of moral precepts, concentration of the mind, and experiential wisdom. I also find the adjacent exchange between India and Greece during this time to be equally fascinating. This was when Grecian coins inscribed with the word Dharma were found representing Greek rulers. Indian monastics appropriated the Greco-Roman style when carving their Buddhas. A time of prolific exchange between two cultures, the results of which we see today in both art and philosophy. The story of Iden Fox suggests a historical context similar to that of Ashoka, a war king disillusioned by the trappings of conquest and power, seeking a path towards simplicity, wholesomeness, and noble intent. The moth goblin sailed over the exhausted battlefield, an expanse of white linen flags. The enemy has called for a truce. He landed, flat on the wall next to the battle throne, a sample of white linen in his claws. But the militant king remained unresponsive, his steady gaze fixed upon crimson grass. The field was active, a gradient of soldiers. There was a measure of noticeable negligence in the goblin men who populated the back lines, and with every preceding row an increase in vigilance, a wall of men poised in the distance, ever so aware of enemy proximity. But all this meant nothing to the Goblin King. 
another conquered kingdom, how would that change things? It was all the same.